Hello and welcome to Insight. Today we have with us Dr. Shah Faisal. Dr. Shah Faisal completed his MBBS in 2009 and in 2010, Dr. Shah Faisal became the first Kashmiri to ever top the civil services examinations. Dr. Faisal in 2018 chose to take a sabbatical from the services. He joined the Harvard Kennedy School as a Fulbright Fellow to do a master's in public administration and policy. On his return, he had a brief stint in politics, but chose to come back to the civil services. Today, he is on central government deputation with the government of India. Join us today as we discuss Jammu and Kashmir post its restructuring and the way forward. Uh, welcome to Inside Shah. It's so nice to have you here. It's really a privilege. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I wanted to begin this discussion by asking you, you've topped the civil services in Jammu and Kashmir. When you were younger, do you think the attitude of society was different to you wanting to be a, a civil servant than it is today? Uh, thank you very much for reminding me. It's a beautiful memory and I feel happy whenever I get reminded, although it has been like more than 13 years now. doesn't seem like. Uh, definitely a lot has changed since and uh, I think by the, by the time when I qualified in 2010, it was, Kashmir was a very troubled place at that moment. If you recall, we had had those uh, couple of agitations before that and even 2010 was a very disturbed year. And uh, in that, my selection definitely did uh, generate a lot of enthusiasm and people were actually very happy that time and I think if you tell me that has it changed over a period of last 10, 20, 10, 15 years I think it has I think it has grown only yet I think people are now all the more interested in joining the mainstream and I see a lot of youngsters now they want to come into civil services and they want to become part of the government and they want to serve in other parts of the country. You will be happy to know that we have now students from Kashmir who I mean I know myself who were preparing for civil services and who are now officers and serving in various states like West Bengal, serving in Punjab, serving in Tamil Nadu, uh, serving in Andhra Pradesh, serving in Nagaland, Kashmiri students. So I think uh, this has been an amazing example of national integration and mainstreaming of Kashmiri youngsters. Yeah, we've been seeing that in the news also quite a bit, you know, but uh, would you say that the role of the restructuring of Jammu and Kashmir played a big role in this happening? I think in the last uh, three, four years, I think this has been one of the most landmark decisions which happened in 2019. And since then, I think one crucial thing which has happened is that I think Kashmiri youngster today has got a lot of clarity in his mind. He knows where he belongs to. This idea of having one nation, one flag, one constitution, it may seem very trivial to some people, maybe even to somebody like me, it took some time to make sense of this. But I think when you look back in hindsight at this thing now and you realize how much clarity it has given to the Kashmiri youngster today. He understands where he belongs to and he understands what are the opportunities in the rest of the country. And I think in the last four years, we have seen a huge movement of Kashmiri youngsters, be it to educational institutions outside Jammu and Kashmir or be it to jobs outside Jammu and Kashmir. So I think as they said that, okay, we need psychological integration of people and obviously there was territorial integration must have happened long, long ago. But I think the mental and psychological mm -hmm. integration I think happened in the last four years and I think that's a very important thing to happen to any people. Absolutely. I think psychological integration is what creates you know, a better roadmap for the future. But having said that, do you think that this sort of restructuring has also impacted other areas? Like let's say Jammu and Kashmir at one point was known for corruption. You know, do you think the restructuring has sort of changed that? I think every field of governance has changed and changed drastically. Uh, if you look at the development, I mean, the way it has been happening for the last four years, I think the pace of development has definitely picked and uh, there is also, you know, we, I'll go back to the earlier point about psychological integration that uh, all the ambiguities, all the gray areas have suddenly been uh, like eliminated. So we know that, okay, the way the country is progressing and we have a certain national mission at the moment, we have a certain national vision at the moment that uh, India has to be a developed nation by 2047. That idea which we are now calling Amrit Kal. 
So I think this vision is translating to the grassroots level even in Kashmir today. So even every sector in Kashmir, be it agriculture, be it horticulture, be it handicrafts, be it tourism, every sector is gearing itself to match the national aspiration. I think that's a very crucial thing and that's a very important change which has come in the minds of the people. Absolutely. You know, there are so many questions coming to my head right now, so let me Go ask ahead. you one yeah. by one. Yeah. Uh, do you think that this has anything to do with the dismal state that Pakistan's economy is in? Or would you still say this is because of the restructuring of Jammu and Kashmir, because, you know, it was brought into mainstream consciousness and like you said, psychologically integrated with it? I think honestly, uh, Pakistan, it has never been a good example for Kashmiris to follow. Uh, there has definitely been a section which got indoctrinated in 1970s and 80s, uh, which ultimately led to militancy, the ideological constituency of extremists, which was always there, which was influenced by Pakistan, which always had a certain kind of uh, loyalty towards that country. But beyond that, I think Kashmiri youngster, I haven't ever heard Kashmiri youngsters feeling inspired by a certain vision of Pakistan. Because Pakistan would always come across as an extremely regressive idea compared to the idea that the Indian democracy gave to people. Even I mean, since 1990s, the time when liberalization, privatization, globalization ha started to happen, the, the reforms happened in India and India went on to the growth trajectory. I mean, even from those times, the kind of generations that I'm talking about, Kashmiris have been very clear that, you know, the, as an economic superpower, as a military superpower, there is absolutely no comparison. So I don't think Pakistan's decline has much to do about it. Definitely, it serves as a reminder that, you know, this, uh, this is the best choice that you have made. A uh, lot of people today, I, I hear, it feels good to hear people talk about that, okay, the kind of choice our grandparents made in 1947. Yeah. by staying with this country. People are now recognizing the fruits of that choice, that how important it was and how different it is. Uh, there are a lot of memes these days going on. You have seen recently the Prime Minister of Pakistan was going somewhere and he is discussing with somebody. So people are saying he is telling them, okay, I'll be sending you some, some mangoes to you. And somebody is making a joke that, you know, whenever he wants to go to and meet any uh, head of the state anywhere else, his only demand is, is can you give us some loan? So a lot of jokes are basically yeah. coming up and yeah. that humor is also very significant because it tells you that the Kashmiri mind is gradually accepting that, you know, there is this, there is this so clear contrast between these two nations and with the choices that we have made and the choices that history has already made for us, uh, we should be happy with that. Well, that's really, really well said that even humor is so reflective of what society is thinking and how you react to humor. Uh, but also it's really heartening to know that uh, the binary is not Pakistan. You know, we're not measuring uh, what we want in the future by the state of Pakistan because either way it should not make a difference to us. Having said that, you also mentioned grassroots, right? Uh, uh, recently the government said that, you know, they've managed to, re they've managed to have democracy at a grassroots level uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, how do you think people have reacted to that? What is uh, people's perception to the devolution of this sort of power? I think one of the important statements which uh, you will get to hear uh, these days is the statement from the Honorable Home Minister of India. And he says something very important. He says that in the last four to five years, we have created more than 35,000 leader, leaders at the grassroots level. These people who belong to panchayats, these people who, become, who became DDCs. And he says that, you know, there is this huge new generation of leaders which has emerged in the last three to four years. And that's actually the essence of uh, the democracy that is there. And these people, when I get to know them and as, as far as I come across the work of these people, these people are extremely rooted in the, in, in the moment. They want change. They have seen, you know, one good thing about last four years is that Kashmiris now have a benefit of hindsight. Mm -hmm. So you can compare what used to be there. And when you see things actually moving up, when you see the situation improving, suppose the number of militancy related incidents has gone down. Mm -hmm. We are this time in midst of summer and summers are used to be, summers have to be very productive because this is the time when you make your living. This is the time when tourists come. Unfortunately, in the last 10 to 15 years, we used to have extremely bloody and gory summers. Mm -hmm. Summers, people started calling them the summers of discontent. Ultimately, today, when you look back and when you look around and you see tourism is at its peak, the schools are open, right? The economic activity is at its boom. People are working. Uh, there is peace. 
incidents are, incidents are low, the militancy has gone down beyond imagination. I mean, there is something to really feel good about. And these leaders are part of that bigger story which is emerging in Kashmir. That's amazing. Even though you took my next question away from me, which was about the new, <laughs> new crop yeah. of leaders. Yeah. But, uh, you know, this new crop of leadership is also a result of the multi-layered level of grassroots politics that you have. Could you tell me a little bit more about what are these layers in terms of you have the district council? Yeah, elections, so the Panchayati Raj reforms which... Uh, have been happening, uh, which happened in rest, rest part of parts of the country for a very long time. We had these three tiers of uh, uh, decentralized uh, institutions. We had uh, the the gram panchayat, then we had a block panchayat, then we had a district panchayat. Uh, ironically, in Kashmir, we didn't have the two tiers of government, uh, decentralized government, which is the block and the district panchayat. And in last three years, I mean, the kind of uh, cascading decision making which is, hap which is happening now and you know that there are these three levels so there are three levels of accountability basically and three levels of checks and balances which are now emerged there and uh, the power has gone back to the people I think that is definitely making a lot of impact people are feeling included and beyond that and it's also bringing in a lot of fresh ideas because these people a lot of them do not have any political uh, lineage they don't come from any pedigree there are people who actually wanted and came up, came around suddenly and became leaders. And when you look at them and it feels so good, at times I regret, like I, I tried my little bit at times that, okay, I wanted to do the same thing, but it feels good that at least somebody is doing it very well. Yeah, because uh, the state was uh, held to ransom by a handful of legacy political families. And for that power now to be in the hands of the young upcoming sort of leadership, is again very heartening to know, but what really is their um, aspiration now, now that they can see the long mile, you know? I think one of the biggest anomalies of the, the politics, the way we were, it was being done in Kashmir was that, you know, this entire idea of politics was uh, was centered around this Kashmir masle ko hal karo. Mm. This cliched and this... Um, Catchphrase you must have heard it millions of times. Some people still repeat it that Kashmiri Masle ko hal karo, and everybody had to develop his or her politics around it. I myself find myself to be guilty because maybe at a certain point of my life as well, I found that okay, maybe this is really important, you need to do this. But what these grassroots leaders have actually now proved is that Kashmir Masla has already been resolved. Yeah. It was initially resolved in 1947 when the nation building happened. And then after that in 2019, I think further clarity has come that there is absolutely no issue. The Prime Minister has been constant, I think others have been saying constantly that if there is any issue, it's be okay. So when you move beyond that and you get that clarity, then you start looking at the day-to-day -day what you call quotidian, quotidian issues of life. Okay. Which is you look at development, so these leaders are basically focused on those quotidian issues which is security, which is safety, which is development, education, health, which is investment. So you must have seen that a lot of investors have been off late showing interest that we want to come into Kashmir. Uh, tourism has been on a boom. I think that reflects the change in the mood and change in the nature of politics in Kashmir. Correct. You know, uh, does the youth realize the kind of impact that this sort of foreign investment, even investment from within India, if it comes into Jammu and Kashmir, what sort of changes it will bring? I think gradually, you know, people, I mean, it takes time for new ideas to be accepted because you have a certain legacy to break and then to accept these ideas. I mean, uh, we were in a discussion some time ago and I was just like feeling that it has taken 70 years of a certain narrative to be broken to think afresh about certain things. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of unlearning to happen. Mm -hmm. Kashmiri youngsters were also very skeptical. I have myself have been skeptical at a certain phase of my life that how does it work? But today when you see people coming over actually and when you see new projects being discussed, okay, we will make a hospital, we will make a mall, we will have a multi-brand multi, uh, multi -brand retail showroom there, we will have multiple things, you know, you have, you have this new cinema, uh, Inox theater came there, the multiplex came. And it could have been unthinkable maybe just three to four years ago that one day Kashmir will have its own cinema. And today you see like it's houseful. So that's the kind of change which is gradually getting accepted. And I think it took a lot of time for people to appreciate that something like this can happen. And now I think youngsters are very open that, and they're looking forward to such big things happening. So that that's going to bring jobs, that's going to bring development, that's going to bring new cultural interaction with people, more people coming in, 
means more cultural interaction, means more like people trying to understand each other and that's going to bring peace to the place. Absolutely. Even with uh, uh, the entry of IITs, IIMs, AIMs, what sort of reaction have you observed? Uh, earlier, whenever you had an institution, I, I can give a comparison to you. Uh, the first concern that Kashmiri students would be having that, hey, who are the students going to be studying there? Will it be Kashmiris or non-Kashmiris? Mm -hmm. Or if you had existing institutions, people used to be very insecure. Uh, what if others come to study here? What if others come to buy land? I think these have been very crucial decisions that, you know, that this country belongs to everybody. And that clarity needs to come in that, okay, if you have an IIT or an AIMS here, everybody is entitled to study there. The way you are welcome to study everywhere across the country, anywhere in any institution. People will be also happy to study here if they want to. So I think now this cultural, this, this interaction, this mixing which is happening in these institutions, it is generating a new idea of integration. It's generating a new idea of national unity. And people, I think, Kashmiri students, as far as I remember, is I, I mean, this is a very unique feeling for them. <laughs> that you are actually getting to interact with people from outside the state who are studying in the colleges that ideally should have been, you know, these are our own colleges. Right. That protectionism, that close fistedness, isolation. that isolation is gradually open, that is finishing. That's, getting that's wonderful news. Uh, does uh, the present status of law and order also have a role to play in it? And what do you think is the present status of law and order? I think the, the first thing which is whenever a place is to be discussed is the kind of law and order, the kind of uh, security situation there. If you look at the figures, I mean, you will see the, the decline in the number of militant incidents. You will see the decline in the number of new recruits. The most important indicator, which I feel is how many new youngsters join the militancy. If you see the kind of decline and the sharp drop in the last few years, which has yeah. happened, I mean, that's momentous. It could have been uh, in 2016 when these agitations were happening, trust me, it used to it was unthinkable for even somebody, I was in administration, I was in the government that time, we were working, we were in the field. There was a sense of numbness that, how do you deal with this? You feel so overwhelmed, there is so much is happening around. And today you have like, everybody can go anywhere. The tourism has opened to those places where people would find it very hard to go. You have people trekking in the mountains and they can go anywhere. So, and South Kashmir has become much more peaceful place now. Obviously, there are people, there are enemies across who will always try to create disruption, who will always be focused on doing one thing. But, I mean, it has been literally almost eliminated. Why would you say this has happened? Is it because there is some sort of lack of support, uh, you know, or just the fact that people are looking more mainstream? So, I think for the first thing which happened was that the ecosystem which, which supports militancy, which supports terrorism, which supports separatism as an ideology, I think that first got demolished. I think 370, uh, it was not just a legal restructuring or a constitutional restructuring. I think it was a restructuring at a multiple levels. And the most important element of this restructuring was that it, it brought a certain clarity to the people that you cannot have anything which gives you any license for separatism here. So we are not going to tolerate anything which promotes separatism. So that worked. I think now people understand that the only way forward is to work within the structures, within the systems, to work within the parameters in which the government, the, the parameters which the government sets for you. Your freedom of speech is intact. You are welcome to write anything. You are welcome to uh, use your social media, but any sort of anti-national discussions, any sort of anti-national narrative will not be tolerated. I think that clarity became important. You know, I used to re really have this question in my mind and people often used to ask me that are we a very soft state? Mm. Do we need to be a little bit more tough with the people who have anti-national tendencies? And honestly speaking, like having seen those agitations in 28, 2008, in 10, then maybe in 13, then again in 16, I today regret at times that maybe had we been a little bit more tough during those times when those agitations were happening, a little bit tough in the sense of enforcing law and order, Correct. maybe we could have saved a lot of lives. Correct. And I think that clarity and that toughness to an extent has definitely worked in the last four years in bringing militancy down to the levels that to which it's now. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, would you also say that society as a whole is now looking down upon this sort of support to separatist 
ideologies? I think the biggest realization that the Kashmiri society has had is that, which often comes in our conversations now, is that we have wasted our 30 years. Huh. Trust me, everybody I meet these days in Kashmiri is in our own private conversations. I'm not sure will you be able to capture that mm -hmm. as, a, as somebody from uh, outside Kashmir. But uh, in our own conversations, I often get to hear this, that, hey, we wasted our 30 years. We wasted an entire generation of Kashmiri youngsters who could have possibly yeah. been alive today. Thousands of people got killed in this terrorism. We wasted around, we had around um, 2,000 days of Hartal in the last 30 years, which is around, Incredible. yeah, yeah, which is around four years of Hartal. So four year, years of collective, I mean, you add that by the number of population that we have. But it's almost Those, worse because it's in patches. Yeah. So there's no regular so life. So cumulatively, yeah. like, and that's, an, so literally it has been a very disturbed life. And uh, you add it and then see the number of men or a person years you have lo lost in the last 30 years. And then see the cost of development which has been lost. Then monetize the cost of uh, education loss, the health loss which has happened. The mental health has become a huge crisis in Kashmir today because, yeah, because drugs have become suddenly like a major issue. Mm. So drugs come obviously because you have had a long period of militancy and drugs are being pushed from across in the name of narco-terrorism. You see drones are coming, they are dropping weapons and cash and drugs. Uh, so people are now suddenly realizing that what has, what is on here? 30 years lost. So that realization is also adding to the peace dividend that people now do not want to repeat the mistakes of the last 30 years. That's excellent. Um, looking at the future of Jammu and Kashmir, it means it's already come so far, um, but uh, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, road to cover. So would you say that, let's say, if we look at the roadmap, tourism plays a huge role. Right now, um, the rest of India knows of places like Gulmarg only. Uh, do you think there should be decentralization of like sort of tourist spots as well to create more normalcy? Yeah, I think like uh, tourism, the dividends of tourism as an economic activity, I think it needs to go deeper. Uh, both domestic tourism and the foreign tourists should be more welcoming and should be more like coming forward to visit Kashmir. For that, you need a quality of tourist experience there. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have definitely been able to create some centers, as you rightly counted, Gulmarg, Pahalgam, and Srinagar. But there is so much to be done. How and do you? Beautiful places. Yeah. And, and how do you like ensure that when the tourist comes, he or she gets to spend more time, gets to spend more money in that place, so that the economic dividends of that tourist activity come down to the grassroots level. And for that, I think investment in the tourism is important. Government will be definitely a partner in that investment, but I think a lot of investment will also have to come from the private sector. You cannot be expecting government to be spreading cash Absolutely. on the roads out there. A lot of people from outside the world will have to be. For that, I think ease of doing business, to looking at tourism as, an, as, an, uh, as a business activity which gives good dividends. Uh, that is to be seen for that. The ease of doing business in Kashmir will have to be really, uh, will, have, will have to be important. We will have to facilitate investors who want to come and invest in hotels, who want to invest in resorts, who want to invest in the ancillary services which uh, facilitate tourism. Similarly, I mean, other things will have to be improved at the same time, like energy sector is something which is very crucial. You need to give quality electricity 24-7 to people out there. You need to give quality water supply to people out there. Mm -hmm. You have very harsh winters, uh, so during winter, the kind of amenities available to the people will have to be improved. So there is a lot more to be done and I think one last important thing which I would maybe uh, want to mention is jobs, which is livelihoods. Uh, unless you have good investment coming in, you will not have job creation there. Correct, but does that not also tie up with creation of new urban centers? So more urban centers, more, I mean the, the urbanization in the real sense will have to pick up and uh, Unless you have jobs, people will not be really satisfied. The, the div dividends of the economic activity will not reach the youngsters. We have a crop of educated youngsters out there presently. Although I appreciate when they go outside the state, look for jobs, because that also brings in an element of uh, national integration into it. Then you explore opportunities elsewhere also. But in Kashmir also, I think uh, a lot more needs to be done about jobs and livelihoods. That's happening, I'm sure, with, uh, as, as, as we go ahead things are going to improve. So how would one go about ensuring that, you know, in the next decade there are more urban centers that could come up? 
I think if you look at the smart cities uh, program which has happened, uh, which is this time under implementation and one of the most beautiful visuals which is coming from Srinagar these days is this place called Polo View. Uh, it has been done completely afresh and it gives a little bit of a European look now if you look at like the kind of uh, things which have been done. They're very well made, very well done and a lot of people are now visiting Polo View because they want to see yeah. how well it has been made. So, Srinagar as a whole, as a city needs to be, a lot more needs to be done in Srinagar, to be done in Jammu. So, these two smart cities, because cities always become as engines of economic growth. So, people have industries placed there, people have like economic activities very high. So, it, they become like centers where uh, people then come around. But also then the satellite cities and the suburbs and the other towns need to be developed as well. Uh, I'm sure it's going to take some more time because, you know, there is a legacy of, there's a deficit of many, many decades which has to be fulfilled. But if you go there, you will definitely see that things are moving at a much faster pace than ever before. Well, this has been a really feel-good sort of interview. <laughs> so let me come to my final question. Yeah. If you had an ideal roadmap, uh, you know, what would it be? I think an ideal roadmap has already been set for the rest of the country. We know that where we want to be in next 25 years. Uh, we want India to be a developed nation. What does a developed nation have? A developed nation is it's a, it's a place where SDGs have been, for example, achieved. A place where you know that your 100% enrollment is out there. You know that the quality of education, the levels of the, 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 the learning uh, levels of the kids are very high. Where your access to health is very good. Where your public infrastructure is really very high. Where your corruption levels are much down. Where e ease of doing business is very high. So what has happened now is that there are indicators and indices have been developed. So if Kashmir and Jammu and Kashmir as a, as a, as a union territory, I mean, it doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of clarity all, already with us that we have to grow with a certain percentage if we want our G. I am so glad to see that some of the states actually have had their GDP targets. Maharashtra, uh, places like Gujarat, they know that, okay, this is our state GDP at the moment. Next 10 years down the line, we want to be right here. These are our tax collections at the moment. We want to be revenue surplus in next five years. So similarly, I think this kind of vision needs to be developed for Kashmir so that you have, you, you perform very high on good governance, you perform very high on rule of law, rule of law, you perform very high on the peace index, the happiness index, if you want to apply there, you perform very high. You perform very high on the health indicators of the, of the, of the UT. The educational indicators become very high and I think those are measurable things. Absolutely. Now we need to move towards measurable indicators and measurable achievements. Uh, I think that's the way forward. Well, thank you so much, Faisal, for being here and like doing this discussion with me. And clearly there's a lot more that we hope to see. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you, you Rami. Thank you. As we heard from Dr. Faisal, the restructuring of Jammu and Kashmir has opened up many, many avenues for the future for a state that had been sadly left behind for many decades because of vested political interests, today is on the brink of a new era. Thank you for watching. Until next time.